Straight Talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome to Beyond the Matrix with Rod Bryant and Jerry Gordon here on Israel News Talk Radio. Unplug, strap yourself in because you are about to move beyond the Matrix. We have a fantastic show lined up for you today. Uh, great uh, guest that we're bringing on. Actually, first time that we actually brought this guest on. And we're going to probably, probably provide you some, some ahead of the news cycle information about Antifa and some of the organizations that are working uh, to really defeat the uh, what we call the Republic way of life in America. So, Jerry, why don't you introduce our guest, our fine guest? Our guest is Ryan Morrow. He is the director of the National Intelligence Network for the Clarendon Project. And he is also a Shulman Research Fellow. He's been a frequent guest on Fox News programs talking about national security. But this gives him an opportunity today to really delve into some interesting things that you don't hear on the news or see such as many American, Afri- African Americans are angered by the interference and anarchists from Antifa. And they represent essentially the social conservative values that they grow up with in their churches, as a case in point. The other is the astounding finding of a Clarion project that Morrow headed about the $10 billion by countries like Qatar, Russia, Turkey, China, China especially, that have flooded American universities and and produced anti-Semitic faculty. That is an amazing development. And they're having a major influence in... uh now in our politics because young people graduating from these institutions are driven by ideologue uh what do you call ideology that is very socialist and very destructive at the same time so guys we have a great show lined up for you if you want to stay informed know what's happening make sure you stay tuned to beyond the matrix here on israel news talk radio Israel is located in one of the most volatile areas in the world. Israel is an island of stability and a sea of war and unrest. In the midst of this turmoil, Israel stands out as a beacon of order and human progress. Each week we update you on what's happening in this, the Jewish state, a true light unto the nations. This is Jay Shapiro. Join me every Thursday on Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome back to Beyond the Matrix, here on Israel News Talk Radio. We appreciate you taking time each week to watch Beyond the Matrix. I'm Rod Bryant, along with Jerry Gordon, my amazing co-host and producer. And today we have a very special guest that we introduced during the introduction. And uh, Ryan, I really appreciate you taking time uh, to come to visit us and to spend time chatting about some of the questions that we have. Look, uh, it's total chaos and uh, what do you call a madhouse around us. And uh, we believe that you pretty much have a finger on the pulse of what's going on, especially in the United States. Uh, first of all, let's talk about the Clarion Project. What's your role uh, as the director of National Intelligence Network? And tell us a little bit about the Clarion Project. What, what do you want to accomplish by the organization? Sure. So Clarion Project has been around since about 2007 and first got known for making documentaries about the threat of Islamic extremism. Uh, And then it grew. Um, I came in to help lead some of the intelligence gathering and the writing of more in-depth analysis um, and research into radical Islamic groups. Um, And then in recent years, 
um, because I was doing some work on non-Islamic extremists on the side, Clarion grew to now include um, Antifa types, uh, extremists, the anarchists, as well as uh, white supremacists, which um, I would say both of which are underestimated threats. Uh, and my specific role at Clarion Project is leading the intelligence network. And that's where a lot of the stuff that you won't see publicly, um, the stuff that we're doing with law enforcement, whether it's teaching them or on a daily basis, actually gathering intelligence about plots and people doing criminal things and then giving that evidence over to the authorities. Now, do you have a, a intelligence, uh, what do you call it, uh, intelligence background or education? Is, do you, what, what put you in that, uh, that spot? Uh, well, really, I was just kind of born to do it. My parents don't have any background in it, but I started when I was really young. Uh, when I was 16 years old was when I was hired for a security company uh, doing research and threat assessments and that sort of thing. Okay, and then cool. that grew from there doing kind of like freelance independent work for different outlets, doing some consulting with government agencies. And then I went to school, uh, got a bachelor's in intelligence studies, my master's in political science, and I also got a certificate from an online jihadi school uh, oh. who actually gave me a certificate in Islamic studies. Oh, wow. So um, I got to learn from the bad guys how they think. And so that kind of gave me a leg up as this topic grew in intensity. Oh, that, that, that really, I'm really glad that you said that because the audience is going to understand that you're just not making, uh, what do you call it, right. uh, irrational uh, assumptions about things, but you're actually analyzing information and data. And that's a, a big, big part of what you do. Uh, Jerry, I'm going to bump it over to you. Go ahead. A good friend of ours, Ken Timmerman, whom you, you I'm sure know of, has a new yeah. novel coming out next month. It's called The Election Heist. And The Election Heist is all about group shadowy group called Antifa, hi basically hijacking the November 2020 election. What, can, what is Antifa? How effective is it currently as a dangerous threat? Sure. So Antifa is supposed to stand for anti-fascist. Uh, and that's so that people, especially like cocky college students, will uh, say, oh, well, I'm anti-fascist, therefore, um, Antifa, um, a, just a typical trick that, you know, fascist communists have always used. They wrap themselves in the language of the adversary uh, in order to hide what they're doing, which is clearly fascist in nature. I mean, like, you can argue that it's not. Uh, and so Antifa, though, at its core, if you look at the teaching guides that they put out, what their websites say, they are not far left as people would claim. They are anarchists. Uh, they are, they go beyond that. And some of them are communists. Some of them kind of aren't. Um, they just want anarchy and that's it. And they hate Joe Biden. They hate Barack Obama, obviously hate the right. Uh, as you can tell, that's their primary adversary. Uh, and I consider them to be a major threat because even though in terms of kill count, they pale in comparison to the Islamists, they pale in comparison to the white supremacists, terrorist results are not always measured by kill count. Uh, injuries matter, property damage matters, intimidation, suppression of free speech. Uh, it's not always about kill count. And the fact that virtually every conservative event across the country, especially on college campuses now, has to account for likely violence, that's equivalent to a kill count in my mind. And I mean, speakers can't go to college campuses in some cases because the security costs are so high that who's, who's gonna pay for that? So that's a casualty. Um, so Antifa, I consider to be a, a major threat, certainly a growing threat in today's environment. And all of these extremes, the three major ones, uh, we do find that they all grow in proportion to each other because they vindicate each other's existence. And when we monitor their chats, you'll see them rooting for each other. Like the white supremacists loved the Antifa type activity and said, don't attack them. Don't attack the rioters, attack the peaceful protesters, attack the police don't attack the rioters who you would think would be the first target since the white supremacists say, we're here to stop Antifa. And then Antifa says the same thing, except notice who they're attacking. They're attacking the peaceful conservative speakers. They're not attacking, in most cases, the white supremacists. Um, they'll show up at white supremacist events, uh, but that's because they're hoping for a greater clash. You were on a webinar recently with Andy McCarthy, the former assistant, uh, at the Sovereign District of New York, as we call it. 
and Assistant Attorney General. Uh, what can you tell us was the uh, high points in the webinar concerning possible terrorist designation for Antifa? Right, I think, unfortunately, President Trump has done a disservice to the discussion of how to combat Antifa and the conversation with Andy McCarthy, who prosecuted the blind shake. So he's like one of the best of the best legal minds out there and one of the toughest. I mean, if there's a way to prosecute a bad guy, he, he'll take it. Uh, he, he won't just say, okay, well, I want only the maximum case. He, he's looking for ways to go after Antifa. Um, but there is no list of domestic terrorist organizations in the United States where you can just ban them, especially if they're American citizens. Like ISIS is not listed on a domestic terrorist organization list. There is an international list, a foreign terrorist organization list to prevent people from coming here, to prevent people on American soil from giving them material aid overseas. That's necessary because that's not American territory. Uh, but within the United States, there is no list of banned groups. So when Trump says designate Antifa, how? There, there, there's, no, there's no way to do it. Um, so that was largely the discussion, but he was talking about how to, um, you can prosecute them. That doesn't mean you can't prosecute them, you just have to prosecute them for specific crimes as opposed to being just a member of the overall entity. Um, and what Andy was making the point is that as soon as you join the group and they start engaging in illegal activities, if the foundation of that group, the, the active purpose is to engage in crime, then you are part of that conspiracy. Conspiracy is just a group of people getting together to engage in a crime. Uh, so he does believe you can prosecute him. It's just going to take a long time to do it. And the process is already underway because they locked up uh, one of the ringleaders who was in, in the Washington DC area, I believe, destroying statues. Uh, and once you get one of the ringleaders, you can say that person had influence over X, Y, Z, and then you work outwards. So, so the the uh, moniker of uh, domestic terrorist doesn't have any teeth at all. It's just a, it's just a title, is what you're saying. And until there's specific laws designed for that, right now we have plenty of local laws that can deal with that. Right? I mean, you have right. conspiracy to do X, Y, Z. There are plenty of laws that can take and prosecute, uh, uh, what do you call it, leaders of organizations if they are encouraging the committing of crime. So that's that works. Now, quick question I have that we didn't really plan on, but I need to ask this. How serious should, the, uh, should Americans take these organizations that border on domestic terrorists? I mean, very seriously, um, Antifa is a terrorist organization, but legally there's no, you can't designate them right. as a terrorist organization that's illegal. So that's like the KKK, it's legal to be a part of. Are they a terrorist group? Yeah, of course. Um, so that's kind of the, the balancing act. But should we take them seriously? Absolutely. And again, my point is think beyond the kill count because uh, part of the reason people are becoming disengaged from this topic is for a very reasonable reason. Uh, they, they look at the kill count of 9-11, the latest attacks pale in comparison, and there are other issues people have to deal with. People are dying from cancer, car accidents, all these other things, and it, terrorism doesn't look like much of an issue. But it is an issue when you consider how it puts toxic rhetoric into our system, how our toxic rhetoric then fuels the hate speech. Most people identify with the concept that the hate speech of these groups does matter because it results in bullying, which then results in people later on having issues you have to deal with. There's all sorts of abstract consequences that go on with this, even the, the defamation of police officers. All of the, this entire extremist environment, in Tifa in particular, the propaganda that goes along with it may not kill people, but it damages our society in really profoundly destructive ways. Even that police officer who doesn't become a police officer because the environment has become so hostile to him, there's so much anti-police bigotry, that is a casualty, a consequence of these terrorist groups. So it's not just about kill count. What great information, Ryan. We're going to have to take a break. Uh, we're just now going into a hard break, so don't go anywhere. We really appreciate you sticking around. We also want to let those watching on YouTube at Nativ, N-E-T-I-V, online. 
You can be, watch us anytime uh, or rewatch the show anytime. You're listening to Beyond the Matrix here on Israel News Talk Radio. We'll be right back. Tamar Yona Show. Tamar? She's sassy. She's smart. She's funny. But she's also a real Jewish mother. Hi, everybody. I'm Tamar Yona. And yes, I can be all of those things. But at Israel News Talk Radio, I'm here to bring you the news stories and guests that you may not hear anywhere else. Join me live on air Sundays, Mondays, and Tuesdays for the most unique and bold talk radio in Israel. The Tamar Yona Show. Welcome back to Beyond the Matrix here on Israel News Talk Radio. And we are back. Thank you so much for joining us in the second segment. And uh, we have Ryan here with us. We've been talking about uh, the intelligence that he's gathered over the last uh, few months on many different organizations. And during the break, I wish that you guys could have heard the full conversation because it was very informative. Let's keep our momentum here, and I want to jump in and ask a question or just address the issue. I just made an assumption that Antifa was uh, vehement lovers of the Democratic left, and uh, that's why they have that little bromance going on. But can you explain to me just for a moment what's really happening? Because anyone in the Democratic National Committee who bothers to look, and most of them don't, but bothers to even look at any of the Antifa rhetoric. Um, one of the realizations I made was just how much they hate the mainstream Democrats, Obama and, and Biden. Bernie, eh, you'll see a good number liking him. I, but, actually, uh, I actually did not know that. So they're just as angry toward the right as they are the left. They hate the right more, oh, but uh, okay. they, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they, they definitely hate the right more. Um, but if you look at the the content of like their Facebook accounts or their other chats, there's more bile directed towards Democrats than Republicans because that's what brings them home. That's where the, they, right. they need to score a victory. And to them, uh, you know, the corporatist right wing Democrats are controlling the party. So that's uh, why they attacked certain congressmen or senators that went to go visit uh, some Antifa locations. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. Now that's making sense. That that makes a sense. Yeah, and they're anarchists, by the way. So ideologically, I don't think they ever could fully be behind the Democrat Party as we know it now. But Democrats, I think, are scared of them, and a lot of them think that these are just people who are far left activists who have gone just a step too far. Like they sympathize with their rhetoric, where Antifa's like, "Hey, look, the right's going to destroy the country, and they're all bad people." And you get a lot of left wingers that because of their own radicalism and bigotry, agree with that. And they're like, yeah, but they're going a step too far. I understand why they're doing it, but I don't agree with them actually doing it. Um, and, you know, they, they politically, they'll say, okay, well, that's a member of our, a part of our base. Let's not antagonize them. So you have Democrats not coming out and confronting them for what they are. Um, but it's very naive. And one day, one day they're going to pay a very serious price for it. I, if not, they're going to pay it this election cycle if they're not careful. Right. Yeah. Right. Jerry, Jerry, go ahead. Black Lives Matter seems to be uh, a web, call it intersectionality, but it, you've got radical pro-Palestinian Muslim groups, anti-Israel BDS proponents, and even Marxist, trained Marxist black scientists. What is their agenda? Well, as soon as someone says that they're a trained Marxist and they brag about it, I mean, they're talking about a communist revolution, whether it's violent or nonviolent. I mean, that's what it is. And when people talk about defunding the police, understand that that is part of the ideology. Uh, the, that's so step may, one. <laughs> right. So it may be fashionable. Like some people I, I see, you know, social justice warriors my age, people in their mid 30s and below. I'll say, yeah, defund the police. Like it's this, you know, new trend or new idea. No, that's what anarchists and communist revolutionaries 
have been saying to do for decades. It's just they're saying it now at a moment where it can catch on because of current events and people don't understand the broader context. The reason you defund the police is because you're an insurgency and you're trying to take over territory and set up a rival government. That, that's what's behind it. Um, now, in terms of Black Lives Matter, um, you may not agree fully with me on this, but uh, when I was monitoring a lot of the activity um, going on with the protests and the online activity, I must say that there were a lot of peaceful protesters who made the effort not to be nasty to the police, or they were, and then the situation de-escalated because the police were nice to them, and they actually just talked. And that went on all across the country. Call any police department, and they'll tell you stories about that. Media barely covers it, barely covers it. The, the recent protests, those engagements could have been used to damage all of the destructive ideologies at once. That could have been a victory for our side, as well as right. all the good people could have benefited right. from that. But instead, we focused on the rioters and the viral segments of people coming out saying death to the badge and things like that. Uh, they were a minority. Uh, the protesters did confront the rioters and some of the hateful speakers. Uh, so strategically, I think it's, it's rather than just bashing Black Lives Matter as an entire concept, zeroing in on specific leaders and their conduct that's bigoted, it makes sense. Um, and, and, and trying to divide those ranks would be very positive because those positive interactions that happen between police and protesters is something that strengthens America. And we want to isolate those that want to bring America down. You know, with, with you saying that, I, I did and have made this comment to several people that I, I feel bad for the people that have joined uh, Black Lives Matter out of the right motive, the pure motive, to, uh, to promote these ideas, and yet it's been completely co-opted by Antifa. I mean, if you look at the buildings being burnt uh, and the, the businesses being destroyed, they were white Antifa people. They were anarchists doing this kind of stuff. And that drives me crazy. And I don't understand why many in the African-American community didn't make a vehement vocal decry of that. There had been some, but not that many. Ryan, in the midterm 2018 elections and more recently in primaries in many states, there's been the emergence of essentially anti-Israel sentiment amongst candidates. The worst example of that is, of course, people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Rashid Tlaib of Michigan and the infamous Ilhan Omar in Minnesota. But in the case of a recent election in the New York 16th Congressional District, where a veteran Jewish head of the U.S. House of Representatives Foreign Affairs Committee Elliot Engel was defeated by a middle school principal by the name of Jamal Bowen, who basically has a strident anti-Israel stand. What is going on? Well, the, I think the political reality is that the populist left, the socialists, um, have unified with the anti-Israel forces um, and so you're getting a package deal. So when you get those really strident um, progressive socialist elements ascending, you get anti-Israel sentiment along with it because it's part of the same populist uh, like personality. It, so it's a package deal. So I don't get the impression that uh, progressive voters, e even though they may be hostile to Israel, uh, not view the United States as having really a positive role in the world and and, th and things like that. They also don't seem to care that much about national security, foreign policy, and the is Israeli uh, issues. Uh, so you get it, but it's not, if a candidate is defeated, who is a more moderate Democrat by the progressive slash socialists who bring the anti-Israel force along with them, it's not necessarily because it was a referendum on the Israel issue or national security. It's just because we live in a populist time um, and that's what the socialists are. So strategically, what would make the most sense is first recognize that the populist socialist forces uh, really objectively should not be allying with the anti-Israel forces or forces that are friendly at all with the extremist ideologies. 
Uh, I mean, it logically makes no sense. Israel is the progressive, most socialist friendly force in the Middle East. Uh, socialist in that very narrow sense in terms of, you know, government and taxes and healthcare and things like that. Uh, so there has to be, in order to combat that, um, people who are populist, preferably people who are socialist and progressive, who make the case for Israel and for the West's role in the world, people like Bill Maher, and that battle has to happen, and it currently isn't. You'll see it on like Bill Maher's show a little bit, but you're not seeing it actually play out in the Democratic primary. Um, and until that actually happens, then the populists on the left are going to continue to be allied with the anti-Israel forces as if it's all one coherent ideology. So who are the Islamists essentially behind some of these attacks via these congressional representatives? Well, I mean, Ilhan Omar is obviously the star. They love Keith Ellison, of, of course, um, and especially being, you know, attorney general um, there in uh, Minnesota. Uh, but Ilhan Omar is kind of the leader of them uh, because she says provocative things that they agree with and she stands by them. Um, and so they view her as authentic. That's really what the populist political current of today is about, it's about authenticity, not necessarily being the best, not necessarily being good, not necessarily being uh, without blemishes. But what matters more is authenticity, which requires making mistakes and making people angry more than, you know, someone who would be more pragmatic and what you would consider to be a better politician who would be better at their job. Uh, so the Islamist forces would look at someone like Ilhan Omar or any member of the squad allied with her um, and say, okay, that's definitely our candidate because look, she's willing to get hurt to say things that we like and that we believe in. Um, and then you have the elements of the populist left that may not agree with what Ilhan Omar says, but they like her because they view her as authentic. Um, when you and say, value when, that above everything else. When you say authentic, you're talking about authentic uh, toward the ideal that they carry or hold. Authentic meaning she says what she believes. Okay, okay. Sort of like how you have some conservatives that say, hey, I respect Bernie Sanders. Right. Because Say what you will about him. I mean, the, the guy's authentic, like, and he's honest. Oh, right? absolutely. I think that that was his biggest curb appeal was he just seemed like a nice old man and that he would just tell you what's on his mind like any nice old man would do. Right. And people, and young people liked him. Look, we're going to have to go to a break, Ryan, so don't, don't go away, guys. You're listening to Beyond the Matrix here on Israel News Talk Radio. We'll be right back after these messages. In a time where feelings have become fact, where rational thought and common sense has disappeared, one man stands above it all. I'm Howie Sobaker, your political hitman. Local Hitman airs every Tuesday at 11.59 p.m. North American time, 7 a.m. Israeli time, only on Israel News Talk Radio. Are you interested in transforming your life, drawing closer to the Creator, and uncovering the deeper meanings and hidden treasures in the Hebrew Bible? Then join me, Rav Yitzhak Michelson, and me, William Hall, on the Science of Kabbalah, where we are seeking to narrow the gap between what we understand of our physical and spiritual worlds. So make sure to tune in every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Israel Time, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, here on Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome back to Beyond the Matrix, here on Israel News Talk Radio. We're on the final leg of the show, Beyond the Matrix, here on Israel News Talk Radio. And as we have said before, we have Ryan on with us with Clarion Project, and the information has been extremely valuable. Jerry, uh, let me go ahead and bump it on over to you. Ryan, the uh, Clarion Project reached a report recently about 10 billion bucks in funding funneled by so-called influencing countries in violation of U.S. education laws. Who are those inf influencing countries and why is this not being prosecuted? 
Sure. We, when you study these issues, you tend not to be surprised. Um, but I was actually surprised by how bad this is. Uh, so basically, universities and colleges have to declare foreign donations that they get above a certain amount, anything sizable. Uh, and that includes business contracts, which can be basically a donation. And so Alex Van Ness, one of the analysts at Clarion Project, and I uh, spent months going through just what was publicly declared, knowing that the universities were not disclosing all of it. And we organized to see where the donations were coming from. And what we found was that since 2012, over $10 billion had come from foreign countries. And then that raises the question from where and for what? And what we found was that the vast majority is coming from countries that don't like us, have been accused of using our college campuses as spy bases, of trying to influence the curriculum, um, including programs and selecting which professors. And those countries are China, Qatar, uh, Russia's heavily involved, Saudi Arabia, um, Turkey's a big donor. Uh, we even saw some donations coming from Syria, like the Syrian government, um, Iran, Venezuela. Um, but the, the biggest ones of greatest concern is China and Qatar. Um, and that's because of the direct documented impact that has on education. And in some cases, going to fund specific professors and specific programs that fit the agenda of these foreign donors. And, and I, I would emphasize that these aren't countries known for caring about the education of American students. Uh, they're not humanitarian actors. And in most cases, they don't have a ton of wealth that they can just throw around. Um, if they're spending their money in this specific way, it's because they're getting a really big return on that investment, and there's really no way for the public to know what that return is. In some cases, we could find out, and what we did find out was pretty disturbing. So, when you uh, what you might end up talking about some of the things that uh, you saw that was disturbing, but what they are doing effectively is re-educating. Uh, kids or young people into a whole different ideal that's not our country's ideas. That's right. Um, and also spying. So um, uh, again, a lot of the schools don't disclose his donations. So just of what we know, what was disclosed, that's $10 billion. It's massive amounts have not been disclosed. Um, after it was learned publicly that the education department was investigating some of these schools for not disclosing the money, some of them disclosed the money. Uh, and just of that amount, uh, we traced about a billion dollars um, that the schools just happened to find out about. Now, anyone who pays student loans knows that schools know how to do accounting. So I don't believe the idea that they just forgot to disclose the fact they got like a billion dollars and in some cases tens of millions of dollars in one transaction. And it's coming from places like China to fund Confucius Institutes, which is basically a Chinese intelligence operation mm -hmm. to promote Chinese propaganda about the communist government and to recruit students and to hire professors so that the intellectual property goes back to China. So China can basically steal their way into competing with us, um, having professors even going and setting up labs in China, uh, things like that. The most egregious example is Northwestern University, um, or I would say the most blatant example where you just there's no nuance where Qatar gave them, I forget how much, but it was a massive amount of money. And it goes to Northwestern University. They set up a campus in Qatar, which is a state sponsor of terrorism and extremism. And it goes towards setting up assistance to Al Jazeera, like the top terror propaganda network in the world. So Cutter sends the money to Northwestern University. Northwestern University says, we'll set up a program where our students will help Al Jazeera expand and improve their capabilities, including expanding in the United States. And they were putting out press releases about this, like it's a big, wonderful thing. And no one was talking about it. There was another professor at Northwestern University who had said some really horribly anti-American things on the anniversary of 9-11 most recently. And the president of the school had to criticize those comments and and almost like apologize for him and say, look, the school does not support what that crazy professor is saying uh, with his apology for terrorism. We look at the professor's bio. It turns out that he got massive amounts of money from the Qatar Foundation, which is part of the Qatari government and linked to terrorists. Like that specific entity funding that professor is linked to terrorists and extremists. And then 
so should we really be surprised that that professor then would parrot those lines? Well, not at all. Uh, Ryan, I, I was wanting to ask you, do you feel that the Clarion Project is being effective when it comes to uh, inf- informing the public about what's going on? And is it is it helping at all? For sure. So there's a few different levels of uh, education that we do. There's the broad based education where we make a film, hope it goes viral. Um, in each case so far, it has. Um, and films like Obsession, Third Jihad, Honor Diaries. We have another one uh, that we're still working on. Uh, Faith Keepers about the persecution of Christians. Uh, and we try to get that out to the masses for broad education. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes the results of that, besides number of views, are a little bit harder to track. But where we can, things that we can really track is, you know, when we provide information to a specific policymaker or a specific activist doing something, uh, there's definitely results with that. My work with law enforcement, very fruitful because I'll be able, I'll find some extremist online, I'll get the evidence and then give it to law enforcement for investigation or prosecution Mm -hmm. or or whatever they want to do. Um, And frankly, if we don't have measurable results, we don't really want to do it. Exactly. Uh, There are a lot of out there that you know like to give their opinion they have organizations to help them give out their opinion and that's positive when it's an informed opinion uh but there's a lot of people doing that and so that's not really what we want to just right. be doing. so how how can an individual uh, be a part of what you're doing uh, how can they stay informed what what kind of links or information can you give them sure the best thing to do would be to sign up for the clarion project newsletter you go to clarionproject.org um, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook and all of that good stuff and, and myself individually, uh, but th- the post may or may not show up for you um, unless you go into the settings and you make it so that it always does show up for you. But most people don't remember to do that or don't know to do it. Uh, so I recommend the email uh, newsletter um, and then hopefully we'll hear from you as well um, because we're really good at getting information from the public and then doing things about it and in most cases not taking credit for it because that's that's not really what we want to be doing that's that's not our primary motive now how, how do you guys get funding to do what you do that's just through donations okay. uh, we don't have uh, any government grants or or any side businesses that's like funneling money in it's just you don't have numbers. a big grant from cutter to no <laughs> to no do. it's tempting right <laughs> it would be tempting right <laughs> I wonder if they could even sue us. Like, if we got a grant from the Cutter Foundation and then we used it for an anti-Cutter initiative, <laughs> like, could, like, I wonder how far a lawsuit would go with that. Yeah, I don't know. I think they have a lot of money to be able to do that, though. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, we only have probably about three or four minutes. Is there something, a highlight of something that you would like to really get out to the public? Really, I would just... Uh, my, my new thing at, when I end these interviews and video segments is to encourage people to be positive and to know that when they do it, they don't have to fake it. Um, if you actually make an effort each day to look at positive news, and I don't mean like the anecdote about someone helping an old lady cross the street. I mean, look at like studies that are positive, uh, substantive things. There's a lot out there. Um, And I try to throw that into my analysis, like when we're talking about the protests and riots, I could have just talked about the riots and and just made the drama as high as possible, but I care about the nuance and the trends. And I think that the overconsumption of social media and negative news is what's driving virtually all the problems that we face. So be informed, care about these issues, try to make a difference where you can, uh, but, but don't fall for the doom and gloom um, and do yourself a favor and look for the positive trends that do exist, but you're probably not going to see them on the news because it's not what drives ratings, uh, because the good guys are winning in many of these cases. The, the overall trend line still favors the good, good guys. Good. That That is very encouraging, and the words that you just said are absolutely the best uh, that we can give an audience, especially during this time. Uh, I wanted to also uh, ask, can a person contribute any information that needs to be researched or have questions they can also email you what would that email address be they can email me at ryan r-y-a-n at clarionproject.org um and to what degree we're able to um we'll help you with research um certainly always willing to accept research and, and see what we can add to it um and that drives a lot of what we do is just someone especially with the law enforcement stuff i'm amazed how many times someone just sends us something or 
even take us out of the equation, gives it to law enforcement, thinking something that they saw was weird but not significant, and then find out. Like, so you is. know, a bad guy gets arrested. Right. Well, thank God we have a law enforcement agencies around the country that are working double time. Uh, trying to stay ahead of many of these uh, organizations that want to disrupt and destroy our way of life uh, in in the United States. And we really appreciate you coming on because it really means a lot to have the information that you gave. Plus, it was balanced. That's what I like. I like balance in this. So until next week, guys, uh, we're going to go and we're going to chat with you at the same time on this same station, Israel News Talk Radio. So until next week, we say shalom. get the inside news on Israel. At Israel News Talk Radio, we're dedicated to sharing Israel's inside story with the world by providing our listeners with news on Israeli politics, current affairs, and Israeli Jewish culture. The Israel News Talk Radio homepage also provides you, the listener, with useful information at your fingertips with scrolling news headlines, weather, currency exchange, Shabbat candle lighting times, and so much more. Our radio programming is always accessible and on demand. We operate absolutely free of charge for everyone, everywhere. If you love what we do, partner with us now by becoming an Israel News Talk Radio supporter. With your support, you'll be inscribed on our Israel News Talk Radio Wall of Fame. There's nothing like us in the world. Be part of something great. Israel News Talk Radio. Straight talk from Israel. Howdy, this is Rita from Leak City, Texas, now living in Israel. And though my heart may have belonged to Texas, it now belongs to Israel and all the fantastic show hosts at Israel News Talk Radio. Hi, this is Michael Solomon from Kiryat Arba, Israel. And why do I love listening to Israel News Talk Radio? Because I love listening to the interesting interviews they do and their news reporting that most other media sources don't cover. Hey, this is Nicole Eko from Malmo, Sweden. It gets pretty cold here in Sweden, so I love cuddling up with a warm cup of tea while I listen to Israel News Talk Radio. Hey, everybody, this is Frank Norris from Tennessee. Me and my dog Buster really love listening to Israel News Talk Radio. <laughs> You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. News, opinion, and more. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio.